And so it was suddenly a recognition that creativity doesn't happen in isolation. It is a team coming mm. together to mm. make a project come to life. Welcome to the Startup Microdose. We are here with Pip Jameson, uh, Times 100 entrepreneur, founder of The Dots, and formerly a uh, pretty big deal at MTV Australia and New Zealand. Um, but we would love to get into hearing your background because it's been quite an exciting one and it didn't necessarily go sort of the straight trajectory you imagined. Uh, I understand you did economics and then you went into the creative industries and now you're really trying to change the way people work. So um, in your own words, where did it all begin yeah it's, it's been like a, i feel like i've had three lives which is really weird um yeah it actually started because my dad was in the creative industry so he was in the music industry and i think there was like this expectation i'd go and become a creative and uh, so my way of being a rebel is i went into economics and maths at university because <laughs> when your dad's quite rock and roll that's as rebel as you can get <laughs> um so yeah i i did economics and maths at edinburgh and then i joined the fast stream civil service um oh, wow. so i was an economic advisor my first comment was to the Home Office. I was an economic advisor to David Blunkett. Um, and I kind of went into government with aspirations to change the world and realised that happens very slowly <laughs> in government. We were just um, discussing that, actually. We were saying that um, entrepreneurship and technology is moving so fast now that it's so hard for the policymakers to keep up with what's going on. It's really, really difficult, actually. Um, so did you, did, you just didn't feel it had the impact? Nah, also? I mean, it was, it was such a great learning curve and I had an amazing, I mean, David Blunkett was incredible. I mean, you know, I learned a very valuable loss, lesson that a disability really doesn't disadvantage someone, which was amazing. But at the same time, I'm just way too impatient. And I did have the creative bug. I had grown up around creatives and suddenly I realized what corporate was actually like. And so, yeah, I jumped ship and I joined the Brit Awards and then MTV. And then I guess the rest was history. <laughs> well, because that was an interesting story as well. I and mean, we did um, some background reading and you kind of kicked off the stuff for MTV over in Australia and New Zealand. It wasn't really that well established before, am I right? In yeah, so I started working at MTV in Australia and I started working in their business strategy team because obviously my background was um, economics but I then was part of the original digital team so it was back you know when no one really knew what digital was I mean this is pre MySpace pre Facebook and yeah. mm -hmm. so we're trying to like work out what is this digital thing obviously Napster was huge back then and um, I then did something really weird I helped develop the business model to launch MTV and Nickelodeon into New Zealand I then applied for the head of marketing role um, I was 24 um, they ended up giving me the job. Um, the next thing, I'm flying to New Zealand to launch a channel. There were five of us. Um, so what was the um, focus of the channel? It was so it was MTV and Nickelodeon, but they'd never had an MTV or Nickelodeon in New Zealand. So it was like literally launching the channels in a new region. So it's a bit like running a startup, but for like a major international brand. Well, it's quite funny because my dad's Australian, and actually, um, Australian pop culture is quite Americanized. Or when I went there in 2006. Um, it really, yeah, it, I guess that must have been after your, your handiwork, but it did feel quite Americanized and they, they were picking up a lot of their cultural influences from um, the TV they were picking up. Yeah, certainly if you look at any of the All Blacks production videos now in New Zealand, they're all super Americanized. They like all the yeah. American brands, clothing brands. And, and the, the rugby um, championship they have is Super 16 now, or how many teams they have, but that's, that's quite, quite like a sort of hyped up mm. commercial feel. Mm. And they're all into their um, sort of Telstra sponsored this and stuff like that. It's, it's quite an interesting um, change. Yeah, it was mental. It was so wonderful though, because it was like, you know, going into a whole new place, having to learn a whole new culture. I mean, what I did love about New Zealand, it was really creative. And also because there's less layers of bureaucracy, you could come up with like completely mental ideas and get them <laughs> off the ground, which here in the UK is a little harder. <laughs> just leave them 13,000 miles away if they don't work out. Yeah, just never fine. speak about it again. <laughs> Um, and, and was there an obstacle that you encountered there that, that led on into the loop? Yeah, I mean, like, firstly, I, I, I basically did a role in New Zealand and started a channel. I, I, they made me head of marketing. I'd never done marketing before in my life. Um, and I literally read a dummy's guide to marketing <laughs> on the plane <laughs> to New Zealand. <laughs> I've still got the book with notes. Um, and I think it, learned me so it taught me something really valuable, which was, one, you can learn any skill if you put your mind to it. I think the other thing it taught me was technology was moving so fast at the time, so Facebook had just like launched and I suddenly was like I didn't have a traditional marketing background but that was massively advantageous and I can't even talk but you know what I mean yeah um and so all I started doing was thinking about how can I hack 
Facebook? How can I um, how can I do experiential events? And I was thinking in a completely different way. And I think that's kind of a mindset of entrepreneurs. You've just and I, I kind of stumbled in that by accident. So I guess that was a huge learning for me that anything is possible if mm -hmm. you put your mind to it. And actually not knowing stuff is sometimes an advantage. I think it's kind of embedded in your um, your mindset of because you're prepared to be head of marketing and just run with it then that in itself is exactly at the forefront of digital marketing. What you need is somebody who's going to be trying new things and not necessarily kind of trying to be overly intimidated by the, the challenge. Because the thing is, you're right, like the landscape is completely wide open. Same with our, our MDs, actually. It's like they set up Angel Investment Network in 2004 mm -hmm. and they're both 36 now. So they're really young mm -hmm. and they just didn't see a reason why you couldn't match entrepreneurs and angel investors. And it's just like, well... There are all these financial services professionals who was like, that, that's not the way it's done. You you need to come and see the corporate finance house. Yeah. They just did it and then they expanded and it was like, well, yeah, sure. Yeah. If they'd listened to people tell them not to, I don't think they would have got very far. It's that whole thing about jumping off the cliff and uh, assembling the parachute or the, the ship on the way down. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's a good way to force yourself to succeed, I think. Yeah. And it's also that you see a problem and you're like, how do I fix that problem? Which is a very entrepreneurial mindset. I didn't realise that at the time. Mm. But it was that like, okay, I've got a market MTV. I've got no budget. How am I going to actually do that? Oh, there's this digital thing that I could hack and try and work that out. And some of it will fail, some of it will succeed. But hey, let's, who know, who cares? Um, and, you know, we did mental things like... I um, I did the first ever in-flight gig um, that was ever done in the world. So I wow. convinced the head of Air New Zealand to give me an aeroplane for free. Um, I gave half the aeroplane to competition winners. I then convinced Dizzy Rascal to fly from London to perform in-flight from New Zealand, Auckland to Australia. Well, and so when you say you convince, what's what's the pre-sale, or do you just do what entrepreneurs always do, which is to tell every party that the other party is involved? <laughs> <Yeah. zero> <laughs> you say, "Does Dizzy Rascal, Air New Zealand, really want you to perform on the airline?" And you go, "Dizzy Rascal is really keen to do a performance." <laughs> That was the uh, that was the first time I realised the power of a brand. Like you okay. know, because MTV as a brand, you kind of can knock on a lot of doors. I mean, for example, we didn't have a battery pack that was powerful enough on the plane to power a bass player or a bass speaker, and so we had to convince the Prime Minister of Australia at the time to lend us his battery pack, which was on his private jet. <laughs> and um, it was mental. But at the same time, you could knock on a door saying, we're MTV, we're doing this really like amazing thing, which is an Australian, New Zealand thing, support it. And the next That's thing, like, you know, awesome. the head of the, the prime minister's giving me like a battery pack. It's really <laughs> weird. Yeah, thanks, I'll take good care of it. Yeah. For you. <laughs> However one even does that, I don't know how this works. Um, yeah. That must have been quite a good lifestyle as well, because I know that the, the work-life balance in Australia is a little healthier. So you then decided to solve the creative problem that I assume yeah. you saw from trying to hire freelancers, which can be absolutely bedlam for people and also variable quality control. Um, with the loop, how did that start to sort of formalise itself? Yeah, I mean, it was just at MTV. It was okay. it was literally, I was just surrounded by friends who were kind of progressing their career in a very different way than that traditional linear kind of corporate career path. I mean, we were all freelancing. A lot of us were adopting portfolio careers. So, you know, we'd be working at MTV, but we'd have side projects. We're either DJing on the side or running our own fashion label, or starting our own magazine. So it wasn't as clear cut as just freelancing. It was kind of more fluidity in our careers. And also a lot of what we were doing is grounded in creativity. And I, I use creativity in its broadest sense. You know, we were coming up with events. We were developing digital products. We were, you know, there was this ongoing creative hive. And I, I just found LinkedIn so corporate and just so linear and so so white collar and me and my friends we just had multiple projects going at any one time so we wanted to create a platform that was about progressing your career but in a way that made sense to us so we look after freelancers we look after people that have portfolio careers and we also look after like people who are in full time who have probably got side projects on the side as well <laughs> um, but everything that kind of binds our community together is like the essence of being creative and that's coming up with a creative idea and kind of building a team around you to execute on that idea i think you're right because i remember actually um maybe 10 f 10 years ago i felt really frustrated with the internet because it wasn't the visual web as people saw it today and it was just like it was so there was all these static html pages around or maybe i'm i'm probably underserving there. they were pretty good but everything really wasn't placing an emphasis on kind of the visual navigation and then now everybody's like, well, of course, this is super important. Like the UX is everything. And everybody wants to talk about it. It's like, of course it was. It's like we evolved to see things from day dot as soon as you could process light in a small multicellular organism was navigating that way. We've spoken for a lot less time and we've read for a lot less time. Yeah. And it's like people do react to good design patterns. And then suddenly it just became like a wash with it. And it's like, thank God. Yeah. And you're right. It's like 
why couldn't people if people can't show you the work they've done visually mm. then how are you going to understand what they're creating um yeah and that's a huge problem in linkedin you can say you work at google but yeah. like what do you actually do at google did you design that button did you design the whole onboarding process like what are you actually doing behind the scenes and that's what we try so we're all built around projects um so it's actually what you're doing at your job behind the scenes as opposed to i'm just a ux designer at google what are you working on well, let's lead into that, I guess, and, and talk about the creation of the dots. So you repatriated. Um, no more sunshine or beaches, <laughs> Darling Harbour or Manly. Back to the rain. Yeah, because it's, 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 getting on the ferries at Darling Harbour and commuting back to Manly is pretty, is pretty civilised. Um, you came back and I guess you were pretty keen to get implementing this idea straight away. Yeah, so um, I actually started the business on a boat. So um, the only way I could convince my husband, who's Welsh, who fell in love with Sydney to move back to, to London was if we could live on a houseboat. So we live on a houseboat on the Regent's Canal. And yeah, I started the business there. Well, and Wally I, lived, you lived on a houseboat. I did. did you? Yeah, 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 there you go. Ah, when, when I first moved to London, yeah. so in 2014, three months in a houseboat in Limehouse. And they were the worst three months of the year. <laughs> it was November to January. And I, you know, I was trying to find my way, trying to find a job. Um, I was cold, miserable, suffering existential crisis after existential crisis. That's not the houseboat's um, fault. It's not the houseboat. That's not the houseboat. The houseboat can't, can't deal but with you. But you come back to this sort of dank existence <laughs> um, with two minutes hot water. I'm sure your houseboat is um, <laughs> a bit more comfortable than, than mine was. I'm actually very grateful to my friends who let me stay there. <laughs> I, I, I remember actually going... Um, it's not like I can't remember where it is. It's somewhere out in East London, but there's this really awesome converted like 1950s. Um, it's not like a lifeboat, but it's a big iron one where they've got yeah. a recording studio and stuff like that. And you've got like two recording studios in this um, this boat. We should try to do a podcast there one time. <laughs> cool. um, but yeah, it's really cool. That was my own experience of a houseboat. <laughs> <laughs> so you managed to convince him to get on a houseboat with more than two minutes of hot water I see yeah we're, uh, we're, we're really lucky the house is amazing I and mean, we've got three wi-fi lines going to the house because I actually started the dots on there so we got six people on there so um yeah the only challenge is like making phone calls I have to lean out the hatch so I have dropped three oh, phones yeah. in the <laughs> canal <laughs> so well, we really slightly dramatic, challenging. like a, captain, a captain's <laughs> phone to just dial out um well, and, and so how long have you lived there for now? So we've been there for three years. So I moved back and so kind of the history of the dots is I started like a babysitter sister version of that in Australia, which I scaled into the biggest network in Australia. So we had about 67% of all the creative industries using the site. We had 11,000 clients. Um, we were profitable. And is it still, it's still going it's now? still going now. So my business partner, we realized right at the end of it all that he wanted a lifestyle business and I wanted global domination <laughs> um, mm -hmm. so I ended up having to exit that business and I acquired the technology rights I then started again here in London um, a number of the team from my business in Australia were actually relocated from Australia to London right. to help me start up again so I went from startup to scale up back to startup again I seed funded the business myself out of I what see. I made in Australia um, and then yeah scaled it off my boat and you know it was literally because I, I'd made it work in Australia I knew it worked I knew there was a need for it and I also so, you know, creativity should be borderless. So the whole premise of just being in Australia didn't really sit with me. If you're, if you want every, all our community want to work in Berlin or New York or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's not about just being in one ecosystem. It's about that global opportunity. So that's kind but of I guess what I was passionate about. The UK market is a, is a good starting point for it. Is it, was it 76 billion annually? Yeah. I mean, UK, London is actually the biggest creator cluster in the world. So it's actually bigger than New York. I mean, there's, there's more creators in the whole of the US but we think about like clusters in mm. terms of cities and so London is actually the heart of creativity so it's like an amazing place to launch a platform like this because you know it's a brilliant defensible place as we scale and in terms of expansion will you target hub cities rather than country by country yeah I mean it's kind of I wish it was that like strategic but we are growing very virally so it's yeah. sort of just taking on a life of its own so because the way the site works is um people will post projects on the the platform I saw actually there was um one for I think a Grenfell Tower project was yeah, it? yeah there's some amazing. really cool stuff on there um, yeah, a lot of the stuff we promote actually has social conscience because yeah. like we're trying to inspire our community to do creativity for good not just like create better McDonald's ads um 
But yeah, the way it works is people will post a project, but then they'll tag the full team around that project. So for example, we can put the show up now and say like, you're the host, this is me the, being interviewed, or you people will put up a magazine and say, right, this was the editor, these are the photographers, these are the people that were interviewed. Um, it can be an app and it will be like, this is UI designer, UX designer, front end engineer, back end engineer. So it's kind of like a, a living wiki of projects and the people and teams that like live behind those projects. And so a lot of the way we grow is people tag people that are off platform and then and, and invites right, them exactly. to join the platform. And then another way we grow is SEO. So we're like a Google organic dream. So if you're in New York, for example, and you search Creative Jobs London, we're number one organically. So so as much as I'd love to go, right, I'm going to go after that city. It's kind of yeah. just taking on this life of its own. So about 30% of our community is now based outside. Well, actually, UK. there's a really interesting angle on this that I liked when I was um, going on the platform, which was the idea that people can start following companies that mm. they like because it's like then there's so much more because I think there can be a bit of nebulous brand building sometimes and I don't it's probably way more accurate now but um, one that's great for when they open up jobs because they've got mm. a whole army of people who've already been following them but you could just you know if you're Spotify I guess you can just go and create like a social good project because you know that will resonate with like really good designers and you'll then attract people on this sort of mission statement um, I was reading a really good book about SpaceX the other night and they've got a ridiculous sort of um, staff loyalty mm. despite not paying the same as some of the other high value Silicon Valley companies because the mission statement and the, the um, I guess the banner head is such a greater good Yeah. so people love it um, and I think if brands on your platform can kind of show people that it's it, it'll really help them attract the best talent because it's only getting harder to, to hire and retain good talent and I think creativity is given more um, reward now than it ever has been because you know UX design's bigger than ever and, and all these other things so um, yeah there's a massive skill shortage at the moment and so brands are getting better at kind of building what they call their employer brand and funnily enough the reason I started being able to follow individual companies is because the best people tend to be in work and so the best freelancers tend to have a steady list of clients the best freelancers or the best full-timers tend to be actually happy where they are however they'll always jump ship for the right brand so I mean an example is when I was at MTV I might have left for Vice but there wouldn't have been many other brands that I would have left for but I would never set up a job alert, never. Um, so I'd hear like six months down the track that Vice was hiring and I'd be like, damn, I would have been so perfect for that job. So the way the site works is you can literally follow brands that you love. And so they might not have a relevant role for say, you know, if you love Spotify, who's on the dots, you can follow them. They might not have a relevant role for like a year, but the moment they have, you don't miss out on that opportunity. So that's kind of how that whole network, but then off the back of it, then they use it to, you know, build their employer brand and people, people are savvy these days they want to actually have a you know a job they love like it's gone are the days where you just do what you do because you know you you got to get money and have a saturday off you actually want to enjoy your life and well they yeah. also want to do plural careers yeah so they want to do several jobs that yeah. they love so it doesn't get stale and yeah and por same well, portfolio is careers freelancing mm passion projects like you know i think that's that whole like life is short you know why 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 would you spend so much time in a job if you didn't love it it's such a waste of a life mm. so. and our generation mm. seems to be becoming a bit more experiential as well which is say that you kind of almost if you do like work you experience it you're yeah. just there like i don't think i ever get to a sunday now and worry about what monday will feel like because i'm, I'm excited yeah. by d what i'm doing um so i think that's probably what the co-working spaces are really trying to tap into at the moment which is that you can kind of feel you know it's quite interesting actually um uh, who are they? Sorry, Ministry of Sound are setting up a co working yeah, yeah. space oh, soon, yeah. uh, which is quite interesting because they want to move into the idea that they're going to help the creative industry. But I think one of their floors is like called the flat. And so it'll be being like almost like a New York style apartment where you can kind of go in. So it's like really your like home away from home type yeah. ethos that they're trying to build. So it's everybody's trying to sort of attack this. I know we work her sitting at the center trying to make baby crashes or whatever. They're I do worry that that gets taken too far sometimes and no one actually does any work. <laughs> they're, too, they're too busy playing table <laughs> football and drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was so, there was brilliant research done that was actually like, you know, people want, you know, their companies to feel like family or their teammates to feel like family now. And I think that's so true. And, mm. But it's funny, it's, it's like, there's like almost a move from ping pong tables to kitchens. It's so like, mm. but it is a homework. And I bound up the stairs to work every day. I love it. I like, I'm just, I just, you know, it's Sundays I sleep. I mean, it's kind of the <laughs> way it rolls. <laughs> Does it, has it exceeded your expectation how much, I mean, I know you would have known from Australia that there was some kindling to the idea and it 
made sense if you come to the creative capital of the world that you're going to have a serious chance of making it go um but have you been surprised by the reception of the dots pleasantly surprised because it's as far as we're concerned and when we did the fundraising round for you it's just it's gone like the clappers um so have you been sort of positively encouraged yeah i mean it's it's mental watching the growth in comparison to what we had in australia it's mental to see the scale i think what was really interesting as well is when we started here was the kind of adoption of the platform from the wider creative industries not just the pure creatives and it's one of the reasons we introduced team tagging because we suddenly had all these amazing producers signing up front-end engineers account managers and so it was suddenly a recognition that creativity doesn't happen in isolation. It is a team coming mm. together to mm. make a project come to life. You could have a rock star UI designer, mm. but if you don't have a good UX designer, front end engineer, back end engineer, growth hacker, you're never going to get that product off the ground. And I think that was such an interesting thing to watch here in the UK where people were much more like, I might not be a creative, I am designing something, but I'm very much part of that creative process. And that's been just really wonderful to kind of see flourish across the site. It's so true from our perspective as well, when we were thinking about setting this mm. up, um, obviously we weren't clear on all the barriers and obstacles that we'd have to overcome in order to, to realize the thing. And now now that we've got, got somewhere, um, we, we look back and realize that if Ed hadn't had Hannah, his friend at Entail, um, whose studio we're using now, then we would, you know, we probably wouldn't be here. Yeah, it's collaboration. Um, yeah. It's contacts, collaboration, and, you know, but then suddenly that relies a bit on serendipity. So I guess we're sort of trying to automate serendipity so that mm. those connections come closer together That's so that cool you can find it. people. So, yeah. Well, I like on. that as well, but you're, you're using technology for the purpose I think it was intended, which is, you know, the one thing that's funny to sort of hark back to LinkedIn is um, because I think of my role sitting somewhere between the the army of entrepreneurs and the the investors um you just get absolutely bombarded on linkedin and it's not a particularly um i don't know it's not a particularly flattering outreach most of the time it's normally like you know investors can we get hold of investors and it's just a bit of a it's just a bit of a strange relationship it doesn't feel very collaborative it's a bit more just like you can now use this huge technology leverage which is kind of exciting in a way because if somebody really does put the effort into writing um a good inbox message to me for instance i will respond it's just by weight of numbers it it's hard to get through everything so linkedin's kind of opened this idea to the fact that you can sort of throw a hail mary mm -hmm. and you make it lucky um but i think it's also set false expectations about kind of how people deliver on that whereas i like the idea that if you're following somebody's project work or kind of it's a bit more collaborative it's as you say i think it it adds a human layer that LinkedIn doesn't sometimes. Yeah, there's two massive disadvantages with LinkedIn. And we, we just hired the fourth employee from LinkedIn. Did who you? Was, um, he's amazing. His name is called Pat Trainer. He's been working with me for a year and a half as a consultant, but we just brought him on full time. And he was the fourth employee here in Europe, and he scaled the business for to over 1,500 by the time he left. But what's been really interesting is a huge problem LinkedIn is having is a response rate on messages right now, yeah. which is almost destroying the business model. Because if you can imagine you're getting bombarded all the time, what mm. people are doing, and especially in the creative industry, they just turn off their notifications mm. and that means even if there is a brilliant client that's trying to get hold of someone they're just not even knowing it's there so actually what was interesting recently Burberry when we first brought them on about a year and a bit ago um, they did a test where they emailed the same um, person on the dots as on LinkedIn and they were getting like a 95% response rate on the dots and their response rate on LinkedIn was like 18 19% and that's because people are just so anesthetized to like the messaging because it's so unregulated. And I guess the other huge problem with LinkedIn is they just don't have trust data. Because what I mean by that is everyone just accepts every invite. And yeah, so do, like yeah. LinkedIn's like, oh, is that a close contact? Is that a far contact? Yeah, they're not really true connections. They're not really they? true connections. So from that, it's actually very hard for them to recommend people to network with other people because they don't know if, if I if the system says you two should network, it, you might have, have actually never mm. been connected. You've mm. actually just yeah. accepted a, yeah, yeah. an invite. And and that also is a huge challenge when it comes to hiring because you know you know finding someone of skill you can find you know a coo on linkedin but can you trust them and you know a lot of time you then hit up the you know connections in common can you recommend this person i see you're connected most of the time they get back to you and they go i have no idea who that person mm. is i just accepted it's their funny, invite yeah, i had exactly that this week and um, there was a young guy who's he had a really good cv um and he approached me for help and i was like actually you know what yeah i'll help him sort of look out for some VCs and stuff like that. And then he goes, he did exactly that. He goes, oh, I can see you know so-and-so. Please, can you put us in touch? I was like, <laughs> I was like, one, that's like, 
I, I don't know. I don't know if I feel like like cashing in my what little social cachet I have with somebody who, as I said, I didn't really know that well, just for the sake of helping out somebody who's the first time job seeker. It's not because I didn't want to. It's like I can't always do that for everybody mm. because, and I don't know how I'd respond to somebody who's like, "Oh, um, Ed, meet somebody applying for a job at your company." Um, it's like. <laughs> Yeah. send them to the cv contact at mycompany.com or something i don't know yeah. um and i think with linkedin i mean reed hoffman's crazy bright man i think the reason he sold it is because he realized that the end is nigh in its current formation of linkedin i mean you know they're really pivoting towards being a media site now because they realize they haven't got the trust data i mean at the moment they turned over three billion yes last year 57 percent of that came from recruitment but their recruitment model will be eroded like businesses like the dots because they don't have that trust data. So you, it, you still got this manual thing of having to vet people, having to find recommendations from people, having, you know, interviews, all of that. But once you've got trust data, it's a lot easier to do that because you can actually recommend, oh, okay, Burberry wants an art director, but we can send Burberry art directors who have already worked with 25 people in their building. So we know they're going to be a good fit. Can you create novel creative projects and assemblies? Like, could you sit there and go, Burberry about to throw out a campaign to um, a load of Dots users, and then they can all sort of get to creative brainstorming like a one-minute trailer or piece to then bid back into that potential client? Is that a... No, it's not a thing. I mean, it was funny. We've had loads of discussions with it, and, like, so many people are, like, approach us going, can you send out this thing to the community and get them to do this work? There's a massive frown on free pitching in our industry. Got you. And so okay, fine. I, like, I'm like, I'll leave that to, like, the 99 designs whose stuff is terrible <laughs> <laughs> and i'll look after the good creators who deserve to get paid <laughs> yeah no i think that, that makes sense it's just interesting to see how it works on the uh, on the inside um uh, go on go on you after you no i felt like you had a good point <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was actually gonna just um move from that point for a moment and talk about traction because i know that you were targeting a million users mm -hmm. by this year mm -hmm. um we don't have to include the numbers in, in, the, in what we publish but if you're happy to talk about them that would be yeah so we just um we obviously raised an investment round before before christmas so yeah that's what we're on a mission to do this year so it's and kind the, of really exciting. the app's just come out as well hasn't it the so app just launched which is oh my god my team did it in three months i literally i'm so proud of them. <laughs> it's insane i was actually having dinner last night with the early founders i'm sorry the early investors in delivery and they said when they first invested it took delivery a year and like a year and a half to build their app and i was like we did it in three months yeah. um but yeah the app's just launched is Thank that due goodness. to the quality of the creative talent you have working on the app or is that just because you you crack the whip something <laughs> something fears maybe three months they haven't just, slept for three months yeah <laughs> i think it's partly due to uh, i mean my 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 team is insanely amazing so you know i've just hired this guy called dan harvey who used to be the head of ux at sapient nitro and R he was um ecd at rga and then we hired this gorgeous designer called joyce lee from us too so they were like top game but also it's partly because we're built in react native which made like building an app just so much easier i, I don't envy delivery back then like mm. react it just the team just were right into their stride of being able to do that so it was mental to see it kind of come to life <laughs> but the honest truth is no one wants to apply for a job on their browser at work because they're bossy so they want to see it they want to do it on on the bus Bye. or the train on their way to work <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, you don't think of like the between their legs under the desk. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> just pumping out <laughs> applications. I just got a message from Google. I'm not gonna. I'm gonna respond to the <laughs> <Yeah>. toilet. <laughs> I was gonna ask actually, which is starting to an original brief, which I think is really um, quite an interesting area at the moment, and I'm definitely keen to pick your brains about. Mm. Uh, which was the original mandate, and presumably the power you'll have once the dots is is absolutely global is there was a move towards creating diversity yeah. in hiring creative industries and technology how has that gone since you've set about that mission and where can it be improved upon um and what's your end goal that you want for that yeah i mean i experienced firsthand at mtv how dangerous a non-creative team is and how Oh, sorry, a non-diverse team, and how if everyone is from similar backgrounds, how you don't come up with different ideas. And, um, you know, there's so much literature on how diversity is good for the bottom line of a business. Actually, recently there was research that diversity in teams actually leads to uh, team happiness, So, which I thought was lovely as well. It's not just about bottom line and how important it is for creativity. It actually leads to a more holistic team. But so a big part of what we do is helping our businesses connect with diverse talent. And actually, funnily enough, when I started The Dots, 
we had um, a male SKU signing up. Um, and so we made a rule that we have an in-house curation team where when we curate people on the site, it has to be over 50% female, only over 30% BAME, which is black, Asian, minority, ethnic. Um, and the makeup of people signing up changed overnight. It was interesting. really interesting. And I think it's all about role models. And it's all about, you know, this is a product for me. And so, you know, since then, 67% um, of the DOTS community is female. Um, over 31% wow. is BAME and over 16% is LGBT plus. And I got a bit of shit for this. Can I swear? Sorry. Mm, okay. Yeah. Mm. okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a generous editor or we can just keep it in because we're all oh, adults here. We're all adults here. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I got a bit of trouble for this on um, Twitter where someone was like, that's not very diverse. But the honest truth is, is that LinkedIn skews the other way. Somebody said, somebody, somebody said you're not diverse. Yeah. You got attacked for being too diverse. Too diverse. Okay. Yeah. So, because we're, we're too feminine, for example. Um, Sorry, who was the top? Um, yeah, just you do get trolls. You know, yeah. it's that whole crazy thing. Um, I think we're anticipating them when we release it. <laughs> <laughs> um. but like for me LinkedIn is a very masculine product it it is m way more male than it is female and so if I'm addressing the balance the other way I'm really really proud of that and other stuff that we do is so for International Women's Day last year and we're about to do it on the 9th of March this year um, we did a complete female takeover of the dots so you only saw women on the dots you only saw projects created by women or businesses run or managed by women we did the same for pride so we did a whole LGBT takeover and we just did the same for Black History Month so it was a complete black talent takeover and it's really magic because there's so many unsung heroes who haven't had those opportunities handed to them that are just so talented and aren't getting their foot in the door so um, it, it, by the curation actually it kind of hacks our algorithm as well so I'm yeah. actually hacking towards diverse talent which sometimes scares my CEO because he's like are we going to get sued but I think that will be a problem when we're later down the track <laughs> but it's also commercially driven in the fact our, the companies we work with generally do want to build better diverse workforces they just don't necessarily know how to go about it and mm -hmm. they're all fishing in LinkedIn but with the same old talent on LinkedIn they're not they're not tapping into this emerging talent and so we've got that as their, their thing. why do you think that diver a diverse team brings about more creativity just different ways of thinking because uh, you get homogenization when you mm -hmm. all think the same you're not challenging each other's perceptions actually steve jobs had this brilliant quote about creativity is all about your past experiences mm -hmm. you know in many ways we're like the most sophisticated machines that exist we take in all these inputs as we're growing up and everything we go through and that manifests itself into kind of creativity and if you are all had similar ways through, then you're actually, the, the kind of ideas you're coming out with are a bit samey. Also, the unconscious bias hits in and you end up basically building products for yourself. Um, and I've seen this firsthand in terms of engineering. So um, we did some research where how women prefer on average to use products and how men, and there's actually distinct differences. So men prefer f free search, for mm -hmm. example, on average, there's always exceptions. Empowered, masculine, <laughs> don't, don't read instruction manuals ever. <laughs> yeah, typical. And women prefer some sort of signposting. And um, again, these are averages, but actually most of our client base is female because they're recruiters, HR managers. So if you're building a product that is more masculine skewed, you're actually going against your user base. And I think this is, people underestimate how important this is from a UX standpoint. Um, and don't get me wrong, I've been really guilty of unconscious bias as sure. well. Like I've done things like, I remember you know, way back in the days I did a newsletter and I sent it to my product manager and he was like, Pip, you realize everyone in that newsletter is female. And I'm like, oops. <laughs> <laughs> but that's me being unconscious. But we, we don't mean to be, but that's what how it manifests. Yeah. So having different ways of thinking, you, you then come to a holistic product that works for all different types of people instead of something that actually works for you. So it's the friction between opposing views that forms a sort of, an amalgamation that is what creativity is. Exactly. We exactly. had a great guest on the other week, actually, uh, Tim Armu, um, who's a, r a really young guy. He's um, Ghanaian by, by origin. And he's kind of, he discussed really like perfectly, actually, like how he was choosing to address it and the biases that he faced. And it was just like, there was so much pride associated with sort of just addressing it, but then taking it on. And he's just like, that's a challenge. And here I go to go and put my stamp out in the world. And I'm going to go with my viewpoint. And, it's something that I think I take a lot of pride in in my role at AIN. Is I think I think my opinions of the media never really always is trying to help pull people together. I think they sometimes thrive on the friction that they create. So there's this idea that you've kind of got investors on one side and entrepreneurs on the other side. And I love the fact that in the middle ground, you can 
get the capital to support the people with really great ideas who will create the diverse pools of talent around them and it's like an exercise in redistribution so if you are uh, let's say working in a, a, a male dominated insurance culture but you want to be involved in supporting diversity you can invest into startups and then essentially that you know you represent your team yeah. culture you will continue to hire on that basis and it's like that has like such a positive rippling effect so i do sometimes get annoyed when people go oh the bankers are this it's like you know what they put a lot of money into yeah. into you being able to create whatever you want to create basically it's like it's up for grabs now more than it's but it, it's, it's what been. um technology platforms like the dots and actually angel investment network yeah. do they create this um equality of opportunity yes which is super important which is so important because otherwise we're just squandering all this incredible talent that mm -hmm. aren't getting their foot in the door and you're so right i mean like my whole career has been defined by amazing men actually helping pulling me up and sort of mentors and investors and shareholders who i go to on a regular basis actually it's funnily enough it's harder to get a female mentor not because they're not willing but there's just less of us yeah so um you know everyone's so time poor and so you know every female founder wants to go after sherry cootie or marissa or whatever it but like you know there's sherry only, sorry, sherry it's always sherry cootie um, but at the same time like you know she's one woman and like there's so many female mm. founders coming through so you know i've i've been so supported by the shareholders i brought on and i love that relationship i mean the last time we did a shareholder we did of updates every two months i put in a whole list of clients i'm trying to get in, in front of and about you know 60 70 percent i managed to get meetings with because of my shareholder base and that's yeah. just amazing and so i i i, I love that relationship because well, you've got john hegarty on board yeah, i met amazing. john he's like I, was, I wanted to sort of give some uh Outreach to him because I met him and he's like the Bill Nye of, of advertising. <laughs> he came in in this amazingly flamboyant suit. It's like he was just like a rock star of like an old rock star of the ad industry and just dressed amazingly and just eccentric oh, and so wonderful. Like yeah. what's amazing about him? He's so creative and obviously he was the founder of BBH sold that, but also he's just so current and understood yes, technology actually, and that's that mix of minds and yeah, he's chairman of my board and he's just this incredible. I mean, he manages to say in five words what I might it would take me about 10 minutes to explain. <laughs> well, that's actually quite interesting with the the diversity of um thought, I guess, because it's difficult. Diversity is a difficult topic because you can sort of assign it by sight. Mm -hmm which is say you make an assumption on somebody and then you, is your kind of innate bias playing into what you're deciding that will appease them. And then there's diversity of thought. And the interesting thing while we set up this podcast is Ollie's very different to me. I tend to sort of just like ideas springing off and like this, and you're an exceptionally good writer, which I'm not, um, <laughs> and can articulate your thoughts in a way that, you know, I don't, and I'm from a science background, and you're from cl sort of classical and mm. literary background. Um, and I noticed that kind of pulls me into another diverse topic, which I guess is your... Um, history of, of, of acknowledging your dyslexia mm -hmm. which is also um very prevalent in the entrepreneurial community um did that affect your education and does it help you in your entrepreneurial life oh you know in terms of entrepreneurial life 100 percent. i mean i found out recently that 40 percent of self-made millionaires are dyslexic which is a mental mental stat like that's mind-blowing so um, absolutely, but yeah, it's a massive struggle when you're younger. I mean, I found it really depressing. Oh. Actually, I, I found it like a really <laughs> confidence crushing because you basically have this thing which is, you can have an idea, and in your head you're like, I've got an idea about how the world works, and I can kind of see it, and then you write it down, and somebody goes like with red pen when you're about nine years old. That's wrong. That's wrong. Where's the yeah. sentence structure? Your grammar's poor. You're this, and basically you end up getting like a C or a D, and you just go, maybe I'm just fundamentally an absolute yeah. moron. And my brother was an amazing writer as well. And so you, you, I then turned to sport because I was like, sport, I can turn up and I can play sport. And, and that's going to be my validation. Of course, your sporting career is finite. Um, but is it, sorry, is it just with writing? I'm slightly ignorant about So dyslexia. my, yeah. correct me, I'd be quite interested to share experiences on this, but my writing, basically how I will structure a sentence is how does it sound when I speak? If I pause when I speak, it'll get a comma. Yeah, yeah. And I try now as an adult to keep sentences short so I don't need to worry about whether they're losing structure and I try and keep paragraphs short and basically everything's on email and not written anymore. So you can cheat your way through it and you just go, what's my objective? How do I keep this as short as possible? Grammar comes in the form of, I, I don't even know why you'd use a semicolon. Yeah, I mean, things like noun and verbs, I, I, they blow my mind. I don't, like, it's so weird. I, it's hard to explain, but the, the writing like you talk was the thing that changed it for me because it was so weird at school, you suddenly, I just fell behind. And it was like one moment I was doing well, the next minute I was like bottom of the class and I couldn't work it out. And What age were you when that happened? I, I had an about, age where... I was about six, seven. 
How about you? Uh, I would say I managed to, to muddle through to about nine or ten, and then I started to get absolutely slammed for it. Yeah, I was six or seven. I mean, I could barely read till I was 11. I was so lucky, though, because my mum um, was working for a charity at the time, and she was doing educational puppet shows teaching kids about disabilities, and specifically cerebral palsy. And she went to a talk about dyslexia. So it was before dyslexia was really a thing. And so the teacher had been saying, oh, yeah, Pip's not that bright. And mum was like, no, that is so not true. And then she heard about this thing called dyslexia. And then, oh, bless her, she worked so hard to kind of get me through it. So I had classes before school, at lunchtime. I had these ridiculous coloured glasses. Mm -hmm. Did you get the coloured glasses? No, I didn't. They were hideous. (laughs) They were like NHS. These massive glasses were like pink perspex. They didn't help at all. Because like dyslexia can be different to other things. Some people like the letters bounce off white pages. So the coloured glasses work. With me, I I more see patterns, which sounds a bit more like your dyslexia. I see visuals and patterns more than I see. So I will, you know, things like if a word is looking the same-ish, I will kind of just write it uh, without really recognizing it because I kind of read a pattern. Mm. Do you get a um, thing as well when also you, you legitimately or write a, a, a short paragraph and you go back and you read it and then you send it and then you reread it and you're like, th- like why is that word in now? <laughs> yeah. why, I don't literally don't remember writing that. And I, I've checked it like two times and suddenly it doesn't, I'm now rereading it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, things but, disappear. I mean, I've had to put, you probably saw me email, I have, I've had to put dis- delightfully dyslexic I like excuse that. typos I like, yeah, on my I signature because like I just can't, I can't get everything proofed. So it's like, but just w- get it out. Were you both um, orally articulate when you were younger? Because you are, you're both now, um, whereas I find it much easier to express my ideas in writing. Do you? Much easier. That blows my yeah. mind. I get, I, I get, more happy to stand up in a room full of a thousand people and yeah, speak than, I would <laughs> my worst nightmare. than publish one article on Medium. Oh, my worst nightmare. Which is, why, which, is why, which is why, you know what, we should, as a test at the end of this, we should write a, an article fit for this interview and I'll write one and you write one and we'll see <laughs> what the reception is to it because I guarantee you mine will be... I, I had to write an article for the Market Mogul, um, probably it was on Brexit, which also is a diversity disaster in terms of the talent pool of the entrepreneurial community in London. We might give some <laughs> coverage of that in a second. Um, but I really, I was so stressed out about that. Because again, you have this notion that I'll, I'll submit it to them and they'll go, oh right, so all that stuff you said in your, your LinkedIn is kind of masking the fact you're an absolute moron. <laughs> and, you can, you're, and this doesn't make any sense. And it could be, that could be somebody as young as 14, 15, 16, who's good at grammar and editing, who then reads it and then just decides that your ideas are not worth listening to because you can't articulate them in writing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I just flee foe. So I just, I literally, my team thinks I'm mad. So I'll, I'll sit at my desk talking to myself because that's how I can write. And then anything that's article based, I literally flee foe, give it to my husband, and then he proofs the whole thing, edits it. So like he's been an unbelievable support through yeah. all of this because he kind of then makes it go from that good idea to actually yeah. good <laughs> writing. <laughs> well, I have this belief as well that that. It's almost like, you know, um, when you drop uh, those 10 Ps in, they go down like the little buckets and they fall into a slot. I feel like words do that, right? As I feel like once you have a word for something, you crystallize a thought. And, and if that word's strong enough, which is why I think it's... I am really concerned with sometimes when the media splashes things on the front of page because I think words can actually be really powerful. Um, but I think not being able to fall or get comfort from assigning things words because you think more visually um, means ideas become more conceptual and they, they just naturally more horizontal in the way you see things so I think a huge area that's going to be quite exciting for the dots is this idea of data visualization the yeah. creativity around that because I saw something recently complete segue I realize um, <laughs> which we're talking about doing AR and VR where you can experience and visualize data and build that yeah. relationship with it. it's just like for I, I imagine for you and me yeah. that's like oh my god that makes so much sense you could see like the health of your company is like a digital visual footprint and, and it will be projected in front of you like that for me is it's going to be well I mean I mean even with the dots as an expression of your CV if people can see the projects um, with LinkedIn you as you said you just have to write something mm-hmm. and if you can't articulate that well in writing but if you're showing off the projects that you've done then it it, it removes that um, that 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 obstacle that problematizes the frame of reference. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, what's so interesting with how like the world of work is evolving and how automation's coming in and you know, things like, you know, thanks to tools like Grammarly, my grammar is now better. Mm. Are you using Grammarly? Yeah. Yeah. I, I 
Uh, I don't, but it's only because my Gmail's got so many like random little plugins. <laughs> <laughs> Done with plugins. But I use um, it because it just corrects me for typos. Yeah, I, I mean, I have no idea what it's correcting, so I just accept, <laughs> accept, <laughs> accept. But I'm like, maybe it knows better than me. The computer knows better. But like with tools like that, you know, those skills aren't bec- as important. You know, when we were kids, like being able to spell, spell and grammar and all mm-hmm. that was so critical. And then we had spell check and then we had Grammarly and all those skills aren't as important. But things like creativity is one of the skills that machines are going to find really hard to automate. And so it's just interesting, like, that, you know, it's funny thinking about intelligence as well. And when I was at school, intelligence was like having this insane memory where you're like Wikipedia, but we've now got Wikipedia. Um, So it's like intelligence is a different thing now. Intelligence is can you come up with ideas? Can you build things? Can you make things, you know, because that's a really human trait that well, computers can't do. Mm, or, or yet, anyway. No, anyway, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> I actually dot, dot, dot spot. <laughs> <Yeah>. Something <laughs> comes up and starts repurposing. I had a quote about that from someone called Margaret Bowden. She said, creativity is just an unpredictable combination of ideas. Yes. Um, which if you accept that, then in theory, AI could synthesize um, unpredictable ideas in a certain combination, which would then be novel and original and creative. Which is a scary thought and maybe a topic for another day. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but, I think yeah. what creativity can do is it's a little bit like um, like a device that floats on the top of everything that's coming up underneath it. Because essentially all you're doing is you're, because the brain is like um, this malleable layer of, of inputs, it doesn't necessarily have to be efficient, it doesn't necessarily have to be the best or... or um, you know, mathematically, whatever. But it's like you take all the inputs that are your life and you mm. repurpose them and you eject them out as like the Venn diagram of who you are. Mm observing the subjective world and turn it into a creative output so i think you continue to float above the layer of let's say data above the layer of wikipedia and then you just see how i could take wikipedia and recombine it yeah and actually more than that and what ties in with the dots is that it's the community of individual humans together yes um synthesizing those ideas and the the extra level of creativity that comes out of that it's actually super interesting because that means you are creating a wave of movement because you're essentially bringing everybody in to repurpose their ideas around what the dots represent which actually continues to cause a, a, an effective shift and because i guess creativity mm-hmm. spills out into let's say um adverts on the high street or whatever it might be it's like this could you know it could continue to ripple really mm. like quite positively yeah and if we get things right and i am an absolute optimist you know and we do you know get to a point where we have got more human capital to work on things we love that's when creativity really comes into its own because suddenly everyone's given the opportunity to be an entrepreneur everyone's given the opportunity to create things that they they enjoy creating whether that's experiential events or whatever that is if we're getting machines to do a lot of the grunt work that we don't enjoy working i i get really excited by the prospect of that that future um, so I'm definitely an optimist, not a person. <laughs> and on, on that note, if you had to change the education system, because I don't know, I mean, it's been a while. Well, so from not, a diversity point of view. Not that long since I was in education. Yeah. But it, it's very much geared toward, still towards learning by rote, mm-hmm. um, ticking uh, checkboxes for the examiners. Um, do you think that there are skills that schools should be ingraining earlier? I'm a massive Ken Robinson fan. And if mm. no one's ever watched his TED Talk, Good go on, talk. go online and watch that TED Talk. But, you know, his whole principle is that creativity is important as literacy. Mm. And it's so true because creativity is the essence of coming up with ideas and building something. I mean, that's essentially it and f- solving problems. And and I think if we're not ingraining that in kids, it's it's that's not that's not how the future is going to be if yeah. we just choose we're just training them to be wikipedias we're just training them to be things that robots do better now so um yeah i, w- I wish there was more you know there's a whole movement to steam not stem at the moment so mm. stem is so important but there should the a in in steam is around art and creativity yeah, and complementing that together and i think that's something we're missing there's definitely a push towards stem which is good but steam needs to come as well. Yeah, because you lose your own objective if your only objective is to unseat the person at the top of the, the ladder, which is to say, you, you actually don't need to continually inspire people to be in the STEM subjects if they don't want to be. It's mm-hmm. actually creating a precedent that said people need to be accountants, lawyers, and, and bankers back in the day. It's like, actually, you cause conflict in people, just let them mm-hmm. w- more well round themselves. Um, it is quite interesting. There was a There was a really nice thing I thought that maybe soothe the diversity issue because i think it's um from 
and I'll let you offer your opinion on this as well, Ollie. From a young male perspective, who personally I've grown up in a schooling system where we had girls brought into our school to improve the grades. Like mm. that's why <laughs> our school became, um, you know, uh, dual gendered, um, or, or maybe there's more gender. I don't know nowadays, but you know, it became dual gendered, um, and the basis was like the school was, you know, tightening the belt. The boys were going to stop being maleficent, and the you know the girls would come in and tie the grades. And to be honest with you, that's that is exactly what happened. Um, <laughs> yeah, KCS Wimbledon has like gone gangbusters, and the girls are pretty smart and like deliver good grades. So I've never grown up with the, and, and I've got an older, sis, older sister who's forty and has always been, um, you know, she's been very bright. Uh, so I've always grown up with the notion that there is absolutely no reason why it's got anything to do with gender, why somebody would be more or less or intelligent, intelligent than me. Um, but I took some comfort from somebody saying, uh, isn't it nice to think of every single human that's ever been born was born by a female and probably 95% of all buildings that were built were built by male. And I was like, you know what, I, it, that's not an uncomfortable supposition, it's true. It's like, that's great. Everybody who's literally walking around the planet was born by a female. And it's like, that's a great thing. So we don't need to sort of homogenize. We need to respect each other for our own virtues. And, and yeah. Well, this is the whole thing about temperament. You, you, you mentioned earlier yeah. that a lot, you have a lot more women mm. on the dots yeah. and LinkedIn has a lot more men. Yeah. And I wondered if that's a temperament thing, whereas uh, where women are more drawn towards creative areas and lines of work where... You know they're not forced uh, to do um, you know aggressive deal negotiation. The things that that generally speaking on the like the broad spectrum of it, men are, are more temperamentally inclined towards. Yeah, I mean it's such an interesting topic. So I mean you know there's been lots of research in Scandinavia and around those mm. kind of unconscious bias that hit in when you're a child. Mm. So for example, I mean Scandinavia is amazing at Very gender equality. Um, but they did this research piece where they were in kindergartens and they filmed kindergarten teachers. And um, when the children were leaving, they let the boys go out and run and they asked the girls to help tidy up. Wow. Now, so there's these, there's these subtle cues that kick in right from when we come into existence that mm. kind of start. So, you, there, you know, it does lead us into different career types. I actually define my career because my dad never... Um, treated me like a girl or a boy like my dad was yeah. like literally I was his child he used to take me to the office he used to and I think you know my gumption and my entrepreneurship and mm. everything I succeeded mm. which in many ways are masculine traits is because I was just able to be myself yeah. and I wasn't stereotyped into being a girl or a guy so I think it's a, you know it's actually not about it's more the whole kind of thing that's going on right now I think it's more just about equality of opportunities yeah, mm -hmm. and letting people be who they were if you want to be a and you're a man brilliant mm. if you want to be a stay-at-home dad and you're a man brilliant but the problem is right now is there's also like a you if you're the stay-at-home dad you're, you're a bit of a wimp you know stigma. and it's just stigma yeah. there and that's bollocks i think every human should be able to be exactly who they are and i think the problem is is there's so much bias that happens when we're young well, that that manifests itself in different ways so i think i actually think from the the guy's lens of um reality i actually have a lot of respect for stay-at-home dads yeah. because i actually think it's in some ways easier just to throw yourself into your work never see your family beat your chest and go out and compete and, and sort of get your validation symbols they'll have an existential crisis when they retire and nobody cares about who you are anymore mm. um because i think actually staying at home could be deeply unrewarding and like i i've know a couple of, of guys who do it and actually I have to say it's completely changed my perspective on it Yeah, I and I don't know if I'd have the substance to be particularly good at that actually and I'm not saying I'd be good at nailing my career that's still to be defined <laughs> but do you know what I mean it's like I, I would seriously think about the merits of that and I respect any body who can do it because children are hard work and they do not stop and they stop you being able to express yourself that often exactly. um, and there's some people who just love children and yeah. that's their cold nurturing but that's that can be a male or a female trait and you know my husband's dad's pretty ill at the moment and he's got an amazing male carer and this guy's amazing and I, I think it's just that kind of it should, everyone every human should be given the opportunity to be who they want to be without mm. all the biases and the kind of oh, you shouldn't be a stay-at-home dad sort of things kicking in and I think it's just all about equality of opportunity and that doesn't kind of exist at the moment. Yeah. Well, it's I think it's, 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 <laughs> I think it is getting better. Yeah. Um, we're coming up towards three o'clock. Yeah. So I'm slightly conscious of your time. <laughs> um, did you get a chance to um, think about a startup book you'd recommend most? 
Yeah, oh my gosh, I read so much, but I don't read physically because I can't. Yeah, it's, it's a hard one. Yeah. <laughs> Although, actually, for anybody who who is dyslexic, um, speeding up audiobooks, I find is really good. Oh yeah, well, I'm an audible junkie, yeah. so that is where I live. So I'm I'm the weird person that cycles to work with a speaker on the front of my bike, listening to work. I've books. never seen. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen, I've never seen anybody do. You are the <laughs> weird person. I am the weird the person. one. <laughs> so I've read. So I mean, I I read a book a week, but I think one that I've been recommending a lot to startup founders, but also to my team as well is, is a book called Getting to Yes hmm. and it's about negotiation and I think um, I think when you are starting a business a lot of what you do is negotiating when you're building a team a lot of what you're doing is negotiating and when teams are di- you know um, interacting together a lot of what they're having to do is negotiate and I think that old school way of I want this you want that and whoever's the strongest wins just doesn't work and um, getting to yes was developed by Harvard Business School and it's about really understanding the other person's perspective and vice versa so that you can come up with a better solution and I just found it a really really useful book whenever I've had to negotiate anything so and who, who is that by? I have no idea right. I'm dyslexic we, we should we at that kind of stuff the <laughs> end, <laughs> you heard it between the traffic lights and <laughs> well, it's not the, the Entail software allows yeah. us to link to it so um, we will we'll look find it up, it. Find <laughs> it. Um, I actually have a book to recommend to you as a, yeah. as a fellow houseboater Amazing. it's oh, a wow. novel called Offshore okay, by Penelope Fitzgerald. Amazing. Um, and it's 60s London, the eccentric micro existence of people living on houseboats. Oh my God, I love that. Okay. Um, and I'll, it's I'll a, be it's listening a fun to it on my bike on the way yeah, to work. Yeah. People are like, what a are you listening listen, to? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the tool you couldn't live without is probably audible. It is audible. Yeah. <laughs> That's so funny. That's exactly <laughs> why. <laughs> um, um, because it, it works. Uh, one thing that happens, apart from, uh, and I think maybe we're both guilty of this, if you listen to audiobooks at 1.5 times speed too often, you end up thinking that the rest of the world starts speaking. <laughs> that <speed. laughs> You're like, blah, 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 blah. Um, which is quite, yeah, it's yeah. quite maddening. But it makes you, because um, the words go a little faster than you're comfortable listening to, you have to actively listen because otherwise you're not going to hear it. So you actually are paying attention to the book way more like acutely than um, if it plays at normal speed because then it kind of feels like it's storytelling. Right. Yeah. So but it kind of energizes you like. Ugh. Have you ever found you then try and interact with someone and you're speaking too fast? Or well, they're speaking too <laughs> slow. They're like, oh, <laughs> just like speed up. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people listen to the Sam Harris podcast on 1.5 because he speaks quite <laughs> slowly. slowly. <laughs> but but that's always been given. I, I also realise you haven't got much time, so I'll speak even faster. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> but the, like, there's this idea that there's a weight of authority to speaking slowly, and it, it unfortunately it does work. You watch a talk and suddenly it's like somebody speaks and says one word poignantly and it, it does have authority but it's just at the same time it's like speed up I, <laughs> I started doing it at meetings when I couldn't get my voice heard I just actually lowered the register and slowed down mm. and suddenly people who were talking over me before would just it works by the way that is such a good tip I mean like there is an, a, a brilliant one of my team does the same and like everyone like leans in to yeah. listen and it's like whoa that's good yeah. <laughs> it creates a, it creates a it black more. hole though, doesn't it? it it creates a sinking point yeah. and the energy just goes towards you it's yeah. it's pretty effective mm. yeah. um, so Audible is a tool do you have a tool for, for business use Oh, well, so you're oh like, God. so let's say like a, a Gmail hack or a, or a, a particular marketing stack you know tool. What? I never like getting wedded to individual tools mm. because we're forever evolving mm. tools. So recently I love Rice, which is, um, so it's a way to prioritize the features that we build on the dots. We used to do effort impact graphs, but the problem with effort impact is everyone, when they've got a good idea, goes, it's going to be high impact. And great. no effort. And no effort, all that. Um, but what Rice takes into account is it takes into account the confidence of reaching that impact. So you know, do you have data to back up that you are actually going to get a 10 out of 10 impact? If not, then it's lower confidence. It also um, works out the reach. So if you're doing something on this part of the product, how many actually p- users is it actually reaching? So because a lot of time you're going high impact, but you're actually only reaching a proportion of your users. So it's actually less valuable. So you end up with a rice score that helps you prioritize. So every time we do our OKRs every quarter, that helps us prioritize our like um, our kind of feature development. Okay, cool. Um, we, we'll, I think you can round things off now. Yes, yeah. right. The <laughs> last thing we like to ask, um, the idea that we have this captivated audience, or, or like I think this probably fits well under the dots, that uh, networks of people can help facilitate things. So what we try and leave this um, episode with is if somebody was listening and could potentially help you on your mission to bring the dots into um, a worldwide phenom. Or um, a diversity thing. Or a diversity thing. Yeah. Actually, yeah, what is... I, that's a good point. Um, what is the one thing that somebody who is listening or picks this up could actually help you with, whether it be a mission statement or your company statement? 
Oh gosh, that's a brilliant question. Um, I'd say right now is getting in front of companies. So um, we've got 6,000 brands on the site, but we're always, so if you work at a company and you're looking for amazing talent, just tell your boss about us. That would be brilliant. Email me. It's actually free to post freelance jobs. So you can give us a whirl with freelance jobs. And then if you like it, you can come back to us and talk about other packages. Um, And yeah. What was the other question? I think I can, I can <laughs> answer the other one because you had um, you spoke about the CES conference not having enough female representation. Mm-hmm. So maybe if people can spread, um, I guess, more female tech talks, speakers, book more. Yeah, I just did a list actually of fifty female I speakers. I saw them. It's an awesome um, one. Who, and, uh, yeah, I, I find her name. She did a bionics company or something. Oh my Samantha gosh, Samantha Payne. Payne. Oh my Open gosh, bionics. She's amazing. Let's get her on the podcast. Oh, let's, let's, if you could get her on the podcast, seriously. if I can ask I, you, I will. For, I will it's so uh, cool. Her robotics work is just unbelievable. Um, and it was basically off the back of last year. I spoke at so many events, and a lot of the time I was a token woman, which I'm really happy to be because I think it's really important for us to kind of show up. But I just was also then heard all these amazing women speak, and I was like, oh, I just need to get these women into more talks. And so, yeah, if you're organising an event, just make sure it's diverse. Go and hit that list, and just hit up all the amazing we'll share that on entail as well actually because mm. then that gives much more coverage to those speakers plus also I'd love to have well particularly uh, yeah, Samantha on the podcast because that's bloody cool she mm. is so amazing really I mean cool. the arms that she's building for children is just oh anyway fan yeah, girl it kind, of makes you, it kind of makes you tingle with excitement um, but yeah thank you so much for coming on it's yeah, been really you. really thank good you. fun amazing and yeah, I'm super excited to see where the dots go Thank to um, in the future because we are hoping to help you out. 